morning. Good to be back. What happened to the snow? Last time I was here, there was snow. What did you do with it? Okay, so what we're going to talk about this morning is... Um, uh, the Alps. No. Uh, lean code. The only re honestly, the only reason that there's... I've got a picture of the Alps there is it's the only photograph I had that had something that leaned. So, sorry. Terrible joke. Um, so, I want to talk about this from the point of view of the developer. And we've got an idea of lean. Lean has been kicking around as a term in software for nearly 20 years. And it, it dates back to um, very much this book um, that uh, Mary and Tom Poppendick uh, published in 2003. But this was based on a previous paper published in 2001, extended work that Mary in particular had done from about the late 90s onwards. And what is interesting here is you can notice there's a change of terminology, lean programming. This is around the time of the Agile Manifesto, just around that year. And it's also the time before everybody got, I was going to say excited about Scrum, but I think probably bored is the right term. Um, most people hadn't heard of Scrum at that point. The big buzz, the big disruptor, was extreme programming, okay? the original XP. Okay? And so, uh, therefore, putting the word programming on something was kind of cool. So it started off as lean programming rather than as lean software development. And Mary said, recent work in agile methodologies, adaptive software development, extreme programming, have in effect applied simple rules of lean manufacturing to software development. Um, we need to be always very cautious when we borrow metaphors from other disciplines. Um, software development is not really a manufacturing discipline. Um, or rather, yes it is, that's what the build process is for. Um, the bit the people do, that's not manufacturing. Okay, we don't carefully handcraft the bits. When people talk about software craft, that's not what they're doing. Like, here are your personalized bits, made in Latvia, the finest ones and zeros in all of Europe. That's not software craft. That's not what people are talking about. The results, which we call lean programming, are as dramatic as the improvements in manufacturing brought on by just-in-time and total quality management movements of the 1980s. Um, so this is kind of where it started. What Mary was doing was looking and saying, what are these ideas from this domain that I am familiar with brought back to software? And interestingly, there's this whole agile space going on. And she articulated seven, what she referred to as principles. Eliminate waste, build quality in, create knowledge, defer commitment, deliver fast, respect people, optimize the whole. Now, these are described as principles, but actually, if you, I don't think they are principles. If you look at the names, they are more like directives. They are telling you what to do. And so, I want to revisit these, but I want to revisit them actually with the programmer perspective. I want to revisit them from what it means from the code to the developer, then to the bigger picture. Because often lean is envisioned from the bigger picture inwards, but somewhere we stop the message. And I'm going to reframe this as a series of goals, simple one-word goals. So I'm going to start with value. I'm going to start with value partly because it's the most overused word that I find these days. The problem with the word value is you have to quantify what you mean by it. You have to qualify what you mean by it. When people say you should be working on something that has value, that has no meaning. I mean, it sounds good. It sounds great. Um, and when people say we're going to prioritize by value, we're going to prioritize our requirements by value, that's an entirely content-free statement. It has no meaning. It sounds great. It makes you feel good. But you need to figure out what does it actually mean. Um, so the first question you always have to ask is, value for whom? Who is it of value to? Is it of value to the developer? Is it of value to the team? Is it of value to the organization? Is it of value to the, the manager of the team but to nobody else? That one happens. Is it of value to the user? 
really don't ask that often enough. Is it of value to society? Okay. And when we say, is it of value, I mean, what are the things that you value? Normally when you ask people, name me the things that you value, money is not one of them. They normally talk about their family and things like that. So you see this word has huge variance, huge range. And then when we talk about value, we need to think about something else. Over what period? Okay, over what period is something valuable? Is it a short-term gain or is it a long-term gain? You see, the word value is far more complex than it suggests. Otherwise, you end up with really very shallow. Most people end up with this kind of interpretation. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. The point there is that's value. Is that the value that you're pursuing? I have no idea. So when somebody says value, you really need to push hard to understand what you mean. So in this sense, value is not simply a goal, it is also a question. And that's why I start with it. You need to figure out what you mean. The value for you, the value for your team, the value for the customer, what period of value? Are you looking at short-termism or long-termism? This also gets us to question, as developers, many of the um, frameworks that we work within. And what I mean by frameworks, I'm not talking about, um, you know, Honestly, since the time I started talking, somebody's probably released a new JavaScript framework. Um, you know, that's not the kind of framework I'm talking about. I'm talking about business framework. There is this idea of what is the concept that you are working with? What do you value as an organization? All of these questions. So you need to ask that question. And when you start talking about things, there's another thing. You've got to deal with the code. And it turns out that many organizations seem to believe that they are being paid for the line of code. At least that's the only way I can explain how there's so much code that does so little. Okay? The amount of value per line of code decreases hugely as a system gets old, as a system has work done to it. Unless somebody puts particular effort they will end up diluting the value of the code. So directly from the developer point of view, what is the value of this line of code? Put simply, I'm gonna travel back in time a couple of thousand years. This is not the only Latin in this talk, okay? These are three qualities of a building that Vitruvius, a Roman architect, um, described in his uh, volumes, De Architectura, on architecture. Firmitas, utilitas, venustas. Um, firmitas, firmness, strength, robustness. Utilitas, utility, usefulness, value. Venustas, Venus, the goddess of beauty. Is it beautiful? Uh, that's kind of an interesting question to ask about code. I'm not going to answer that today, but we'll get close. So I just want to concentrate on utilitas. The very minimum that we should be expecting when we are looking at our code is that it has utility. It is useful. It solves a problem. That code is there because somebody needs something from it. And that somebody could be another piece of code, another piece of code, or an end user. In other words, this has a job to do. It is useful. That's a very hard thing to do. We have a real problem with most systems. It's not just verbose code. It's not just code that is very long-winded. Because sometimes what happens is people, I don't think people necessarily sit down and say, you know what? I'm going to write some really long-winded code today. I'm just going to, I could take one line, but I'm going to write 20. I'm going to take the simple idea and turn it into something complex. I don't think people sit down with that objective. But what happens is that we are often caught in a trap where our first idea, when you're playing around with ideas, you don't yet know what that idea looks like. And we are not very good at that question of coming back to the thing. We write the first thing, it seems to work, and then we check it in. And when we say it works, what do we actually mean? When you run it, it doesn't do something unexpected. That's a very shallow definition of it works. 
Does it work for the business? Does it work for future developers? Oh, no, shit, this is really bad. It's like the first thing I thought of. Maybe I should do something with it. We need to be of the idea that our code is not permanent, that we are able to update as our knowledge updates. I'm going to come back to knowledge. The other thing is, you know what? You've got to get rid of dead code. I gave a talk here two years ago, The Error of Our Ways. I had a whole section devoted to how much money has been lost through dead code that I know of, oh, billions. Pick a currency, doesn't matter, billions, simply because of dead code. So when somebody says, oh, that dead code, it doesn't matter, it'll never get executed. If it doesn't get executed, what's it doing there? It has no value. But there's always this thing. There's a kind of a, a developer arrogance. Oh, we don't need to worry about that. I know it will never get executed. Now, do you know it or do you just believe it? What happens if it's not actually, well, dead? What happens if you end up with the zombie apocalypse and it comes back to life? That's where rockets explode, where companies go out of business because they trade in the wrong way against the wrong model of the market. There are so many stories about this. Dead code has a value, and the value is negative. Yeah, It's not a hard thing to do. You don't even need strong refactoring tools. What you tend to find is culture and mindset. People say, oh, well, we can't delete it because we don't know if anybody uses it. Now you've just told me something about how much you know about your code. You're basically saying we have no idea what's happening with our code. Our code is insecure because we don't know what it does. Our code is unsafe because we don't know what it does. That is very telling. That's where we need to focus. So therefore, we don't need to just think about adding code. I find very few very few books, very few blogs, and very few discussions, people ever talk about how they retire the code. They spend a lot of time talking about, oh, we generate this, or we do this, and we add this, and when you want to add this, and when you want to refactor this to add this, there's lots of addition. But life is made up of two ends. What is the natural life cycle of your code? Under what circumstances do you remove it? Now, this is not a new idea. We actually have it. You can see it in networking software. You can see it in network protocols. They have a time to live, TTL, so that dead packets don't dominate your network. We have this in things that we build. This is not simply a consequence of life. Credit cards have expiry dates. Sometimes it is a matter of life. Yogurt has an expiry date. You know, Unless you want to create new life, I, I suggest you respect it. But that's the point. We have this idea that everything has a life cycle, except code. We're really bad at this. And we've kind of slowly but surely started acknowledging that this may be a thing. But that's just a little tag. That's not a philosophy. That's not a, we as a team have a process and a philosophy for how we retire code and how we retire features. Yeah, death is a part of life. Death is a part of product development. Projects don't worry about death. Products have to. That's a really important part. Okay? In other words, if you have an entity, it stays alive because the things that it is made of have a natural life cycle that is shorter. I am not the same person that I was when I was born. Okay? I might share a few molecules, but mostly it's new. <laughs> Disappointing. So... We keep talking about incremental development. We need to talk a little more about decremental development. But there's a lot of things here that overlap in another area, that push us into another thing. Quality. Funnily, this, was one of, this is a word that when I got into software development, people used the word quality a lot more. Not because they had it, but mostly because they didn't have it. I'm not saying that the stuff we do now is necessarily better or worse but the conversation specifically using that word as opposed to anything else were much stronger. And so quality covers many things. I'm going to focus initially on the idea of simply robustness. It works. It doesn't fall over. That's a kind of basic requirement. It works as expected. Not only does it work as expected, but we, it doesn't have nasty side effects when we do things that are stupid, because guess what? We are human. 
Well, I'm pretty sure most of you are. But here's an interesting thing. When we talk about robustness, I want to talk about the quality of the code itself as an entity. And this is an interesting one because this takes us into the territory of things like technical debt. And what I've found recently was a, an interesting way of looking at it because sometimes the technical debt is probably one of the most accessible metaphors that we have for trying to reason about code and the problems we might have within it. Now, when Ward Cunningham introduced the term technical debt in 1992, he did not imagine that people would run up huge amounts of it intentionally. The problem is, it turns out, people have very different relationships with debt. For some people, for example, credit card debt, for some people, they pay back their credit cards every month. I think Ward is one of those people. For some people, a credit card is magic money with a bit of inconvenience attached. And so therefore, running up a debt is not a bad thing. I remember discussing with, you know, over here, well, discussing in a, uh, with a group of people who are from startups a number of years ago. There were two people who were talking about their burn rate, and this is financial debt, not technical debt. And it was kind of like a pissing contest. Who was burning up the most investor money? Who was creating the bigger debt financially? That was a mark of achievement. The problem is that some people regard that, regard technical debt as a mark of achievement. That not, that's not why Ward originally introduced it. He introduced it for a very different reason. It's the idea that you are able to temporarily get an advantage as long as you pay something back. And it's the paying back. Remember I said the thing about death? There's two events. There's creation and then there's destruction or removal, addition, removal. We make the debt, we pay the debt. We seem to be really good at this side. This side, not so much. But sometimes people sort of say, oh, it's just a technical debt problem or we've got technical debt. Let's go back to worrying about what the customer wants. I want you to go to the customer and say, you have never seen a code base like ours. Do you, you know, let me tell you all the problems with it. Anyway, what did you want again? Your features, are they really important? Do you want us to deliver features next year as well or the year after? Whenever people tell me, oh, the customer never wants us to pay back technical debt, I think that's a little bit dishonest. Very few people have ever gone to a customer and said, this is what this is gonna cost. This is what this is gonna mean in six months, 12 months, two years, three years. That's what it's gonna mean. When you tell people this is their repayment sense, if when you tell people, you know that loan you took out, we're gonna send people around with baseball bats to recover it, and that is your cost. That's the issue. Technical debt is also not just that issue. It has other consequences. Technical debt is something that will lead to staff problems. Why do people wanna work in that? If they have a choice, if people don't have a choice, they don't have a choice, but if they feel they have a choice to move elsewhere, they will. It also has some really interesting implications for security. Because what you're saying, when you say technical debt, you're basically saying, we have no idea what our code does. Or there are bits of our code that we don't properly understand. There are bits of our code base that we do not properly control. Anyway, by the way, our system is very secure. Those two statements do not live in the same sentence. Okay? Security, part of it is knowledge. Compliance, defects, all of these things are related to this. So there's a deeper case here. One of the oldest pieces of advice that still survives from Intelligence Guide to Designing Programs is this. Remember there is no code faster than no, than no code. It is one of the simplest things to optimize. Sometimes removing something is the thing that gives you the performance. Now I've, I've, worked, with, I've worked with a number of teams over the years and sometimes Performance improvements are, let's add complexity, let's handle special cases. Sometimes it's, let's get rid of special cases. It's not always add addition. Sometimes it's actually removal. Sometimes it is actually asking the hard question and saying, do we actually need this? And when you get rid of it, suddenly everything goes faster. With one team, that was actually a simple question of network-based and disk-based I.O. It turns out there was a whole load of I.O. they didn't need to do. And when they got rid of that, 
it was, it was like they'd taken the brakes off when they were driving. It's like they'd been, their code had been driving around with one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brake. But suddenly, poof, they got a like 200% um, speed up. So they, we can generalize this. There is no code cheaper to maintain than no code. There's no code more secure than no code. So this is not unique to software. We see it in other disciplines. I love the, the Miles Davis perspective. I mean, honestly, I always thought the trumpet was one of the least sexy instruments you could ever have. I mean, trumpets do not scream rock and roll at you, but Miles Davis managed it. I always listen to what I can leave out. This is a fundamental aspect, and there's an idea here, paying attention to what's going on. Sometimes we're in a hurry. We're all about the speed. I think we need to slow down. I'll get to that one. Now, there's this interesting thing called knowledge. What we do in code is knowledge work. What you are doing is codifying, quite literally codifying knowledge. You are codifying an understanding of this is the world of the problem and this is the technical world and this is how we as a team potentially believe you can bring these two together using um, the technologies that we have against the context that we are aware of. And you're going to organize your knowledge. When you separate things out according to whatever paradigm you're using, the paradigm gives you a model of organizing your knowledge. It's appropriate we're in a library. There is a whole idea of how do you structure knowledge. There's more than one way to do it. And you may have a particular philosophy. You may go, this is a, a data flow based organization of knowledge. Or this is a classic applicative functional model. Or this is a reactive model or this is a classic object-oriented model, or this is an enterprise object-oriented model, I'm going to distinguish those two. Enterprise object orientation is generally 10 times bigger than classic object orientation. Uh, and it will involve 10 times more people. Now, funny, I'm mentioning 10 because there is another aspect. We have this myth about the 10x developer. And there's lots of things been written for and against it, but my favorite quote on uh, this is actually from Brandon Schwartz. I love this whole idea. To be a 10x developer, you need to be a good developer who helps 10 other people get better at what they do. That's a lovely way of putting it. It is the idea of, quite simply, you're going to communicate. Knowledge, you can localize knowledge, you can keep knowledge in one place, but it turns out that's not a lot of use. If you put a lot of effort into figuring out what that one variable called I does, your initial instinct was it's an index because it's I, and then you discovered it wasn't, and you discovered later that it was an altitude, or maybe later that it was an upper limit, or maybe, who knows, and you make a note to yourself and you go, I know what this is. You have just rediscovered something that somebody else did. But you've not yet created knowledge, because it's yours. The next person along, probably you actually, will have forgotten that. Okay, that knowledge has a half-life. In about two weeks' time, it will be gone. You'll come back and go, I, oh, that's an index, and you'll go through the high. <laughs> and you'll have this kind of haunting sense of deja vu. And maybe that will speed you up. But that thing you could have done, you could have just renamed it. And that would have been a communication. But there's something more to communication than this. And it's an interesting thing. The word communicate comes from the Latin communicare. I said there'd be more Latin. Communicare. I, I also like the fact that in English, the default reading of this is communicare. This is the origin of the word community. It is the origin of the word common. What this means in Latin is that you, to share among many. That is what the word communicate has as its original meaning, to share among many. That's a great meaning. And sometimes that is the knowledge you have about your tools. Sometimes that is the knowledge you have about the architecture. Sometimes it is simply the stuff you put in the code. So a book I published 10 years ago, and Currently, with Trisha G, um, uh, we're editing 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know, so watch out for that in the new year. Um, uh, Dan North had this lovely piece, Code in the Language of the Domain. There is a reason that we care about this. But 
When we talk about coding in the language of the domain, that is not simply about the name. Sometimes people misunderstand. They think that coding in the language of the domain just means using good names. No, it's, that's the starting point. But a good name is more than a label. If you look at this piece of code, you will see that all the names that belong to the user, as opposed to the ones that are in the, uh, the Java collections, are clear. They are good. There's nothing I could do to improve them. Portfolio IDs by trader. OK. Trader, portfolio. Th these are great. The only abbreviation in there is not a programmer abbreviation. It's a real world abbreviation. ID. That's a real world abbreviation. The, this looks really like we're using the language of the domain. But that's not what it means. Language also involves other structures. This is what this means. And this is the interesting idea that the language will shape your thoughts. You're not simply moving collections around. There is a purpose. What we're doing here is preventing um, insider dealing. Traders cannot look at everything. There are certain portfolios that they cannot look at and should not look at by law, by, by governance. So therefore, this is the piece of code that does that. This does exactly what this does. It's a very simple piece of encapsulation. But that's what encapsulation is about. Encapsulation is not about making data private. People will often misunderstand that, although I wish they at least understood that. It's not about making data private. Making data private is a consequence of encapsulation. As Michael Feathers notes, encapsulation is important, but the reason why it is important is more important. Yeah, just digest that slowly. Encapsulation helps us reason about our code. It allows us to reason. It allows us to think. It allows us to create knowledge, to have knowledge, to pass on knowledge. That's what it's about. Quite literally, we're talking about reasonable code. The word reasonable in English has two meanings. The most common one that people know of is, that's OK. You will hear British people in particular saying, that's reasonable. That's what we say to everything. Yeah. The world is going to hell. Hmm, yeah, that's reasonable. Oh, that is the best thing I have ever seen. That's reasonable. Yeah, we've got a kind of flat response. But the idea of reason is generally positive. But its original meaning is, you can reason about this. Is my code reasonable? Is it OK? But also, can I think about it? In well-encapsulated code, there are fewer paths to follow as you try to understand it. Understanding and knowledge are intimately related. Encapsulation isn't an end in itself. It is a tool for understanding. That is what we want. Our knowledge is there so that we can create and respond to it. And response also involves handling change. Oh, change, we are terrible at this. So, this is... Um, this is, uh, I think the government, the British government have been having a few problems in recent years. You may have noticed uh, Britain is running a rather large social experiment. Um, I'd, I'd say it's not going well. Don't do this at home. And this is the, this is the kind of the next generation computer that will be coming out of Britain. Because apparently we're going to make everything ourselves now. It's silicon-based. <laughs> and twice a year, it gives the right answer. We're not sure why or how, but it does. What we have here is, yeah, we've moved from Latin to Greek, monolithos. Monoliths. One stone, one heavy stone. A stone, stones that are so hard to move that it takes teams of people and we look back in time, we look at this, and we go, how did they build it? And we go in to work on Monday, and we look at it, and we go, how did they build it? Why did they build it? How does it work? And you know what we originally envisioned when the system was young? This is what we had in mind. Beautiful, small stones, elegant, with a kind of like, sort of nice Japanese seaweed aesthetic going on. This is my youngest son when he was five. It's just like he arranged this. It's just like, yeah. And this is what you hear when people say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're talking about microservices. 
yeah, you know what happens to microservice architectures? If you don't really know how to do the architecture thing, and you don't really respect the code, and you don't slow down to ask the questions and say, how are we organizing the knowledge? Are we making this valuable for the people who work in it and valuable in the long term, not just the short term, for the people who use it? If you just go at it thinking microservices is the answer, this is what you get. The observation was made in the early 1980s by Alan Perlis, the first winner of the Turing Award. In the long run, every program becomes Rococo and then rubble. This is the fate of everything if we do not pay attention to it. That is what we're trying to do. This is how we organize our knowledge, but it is also the fact that knowledge changes. Now, this is something we are very poor at doing. We have an assumption that everything we know is fixed even though that is contradicted regularly. Our understanding of a system is going to be different, even if, even if requirements never changed. So I'm going to run a simple thought experiment here. The great thing about thought experiments is that you can defy the laws of physics. Imagine that you had the perfect specification that contained every piece of information you ever needed. And it was all given to you up front. And not only did it contain every piece of knowledge you ever needed, it was also comprehensible. And it was never going to change. And because I'm feeling generous, because it's Friday, we're, not, we're going to allow, we're going to basically prevent change to everything else except time. Oh, no, no, there's going to be no team change, no technology change, there's going to be no market change. Everything has been frozen in place. And yet, there is still change. You, your knowledge. As time progresses, as you build a thing, you learn how to build it. You learn what it is that you're building. The, the, those brilliant ideas you had six months ago don't even seem so brilliant now, because you, you have better ideas. You truly understand how to build something. What we've just done there is completely artificial, but what we did do was eliminate requirements change. It turns out that even when you eliminate all sources of change, there is still change. That is your knowledge. Oh, of course, there are two exceptions. One is you already know everything. I have met people who have that belief. They, that is a problem. Or you're not very good at learning. In other words, you will never learn anything. I've also met those people. They've been in the industry decades, and yet they seem to have acquired nothing. Their knowledge has flatlined. But that's the point. Change is intrinsic to what we do. Because it is knowledge work, you are always operating with incomplete knowledge. So even if the customer never wanted to change anything, even if the technology never changed, there would still be change. It is normal. And how do we account for it? Well, lovely observation. Um, so Haggard Hawks is a, um, uh, a Twitter feed and actually Instagram feed that I follow presents unusual words, um, and I missed this one until uh, Michael uh, retweeted this with the observation, a word for the software architecture lexicon. Traumatropism, the regrowth of a plant or tree, often in a bizarre shape or direction as a result of earlier damage or trauma, like a lightning strike, or a company merger, or a technology migration, or a you name it. But that's great, because this is now you can go into meetings and you've got a richer vocabulary for describing. You can say, oh yeah, that class, yeah, we've got some real traumatropism in there. Yeah. Or we are experiencing traumatropic technical debt. Oh, that's good. That is good. Traumatropic technical debt, TTD, okay? <laughs> you heard it here first, okay. So the point here is that this is what natural systems do. And this is fine, except that I don't have to make, we're not trying to build a company around that tree. We're not trying to build a team around that tree. We do have some control. Code is ours. We don't get to control nature. Every time we try, nature tends to fight back. The problem is, when we tell people things might change, they generally say, oh, I see what you mean. We need to generalize. We need to make everything configurable. Yeah, that doesn't generally work out. That brings with it complexity. It brings with it masses of guesswork, because what you're doing is you're working without knowledge. You're saying, this might change. And if it might change, it might change in this way. 
There's a lot of mights and maybes in this. It's a game of probabilities you will probably lose, and you're going to end up adding a lot of complexity. It turns out the easiest way to future-proof your code is to get rid of all this stuff, to go into the future streamlined, kind of ready for, ready for anything. Keep the code as lean as possible. Just get rid of the stuff it doesn't need. Make it focused. This is what we're doing. Okay? And this is easy to, well, easy to evolve. We need a philosophy of how we evolve. This is something that platforms have struggled with. Um, Java has started dealing with it. Uh, I've noticed C++ has started dealing with it. Different languages and platforms often had this blind view of the future is just addition. The future does not involve experimentation. The future does involve experimentation because the future branches. We don't know which path we're going to take. And so this is the idea of how do you deal with this uncertainty? And there are lots of different approaches, but you have to acknowledge it. The other one is this other idea. Write code that is easy to delete, not easy to extend. We've got caught in a trap thinking that everything must be extensible. Okay, the idea I must be able to add and plug in and do that. Sometimes that is exactly what you need. A lot of the time it is not. You know, there is this idea of find out which path you're on. And sometimes if you're really not sure, then travel light. Okay, the lean approach, the more streamlined approach is what you need. The plug-in architecture that you think you need will become apparent over time if you're not sure of it. If you already have experience of what it should look like, well done. You've got knowledge. But if you don't, you're better off taking a streamlined view. And this is old knowledge. If you're not sure of something, if you have a lack of knowledge, then how do you organize it? Well, encapsulate it. It turns out that this is a structuring technique. This is 1972. We propose one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide such a decision from the others. This advice is not new. What is interesting is that sometimes when I, I, I quote this, people say, yeah, but how do you know that their design decision is difficult? Well, sometimes you already know because you're sitting there going like, ah, I've been wrestling with this problem. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out something here that's really quite an interesting one. Maybe you are not the best person to determine this. Maybe the fact that you can't agree with your colleague is the most interesting piece of information that you have, and you're not looking at that. You might, dis you might regard it as a difference of opinion of the, te the technology or the coding style that should be used. But actually, what that is telling you is the fact that the two of you, or the three of you, or more, have a difference of opinion, and I'm going to guess because you're developers, you're probably not too stupid. You're probably reasonably well informed. It turns out that that's the world or the universe telling you this might be difficult, this might change. So you have to kind of listen around. The fact that somebody thinks differently actually is an indicator. We probably don't want to have everybody depend on this assumption. I wonder if I need to add an isolation layer, a private keyword or whatever it is, at whatever scale. It's quite an important yet really simple idea. It doesn't involve normally a lot of code, it just involves adding a little bit of distance. And this is an interesting observation because it also teaches us why it is that one of the reasons that we care about loose coupling to reduce dependencies in a system. The idea is to allow you to change your mind. Yeah, your knowledge is not perfect. And if I tightly couple to one assumption of knowledge, and it changes, then I'm going to have to do more work than if I kept it a little bit further away. Okay? And we see lots of examples. I think it's a standard example that I tend to use. I get people to talk about how would you represent a date? The reason I pick on dates is because apparently it's a really easy problem that everybody gets wrong. Yes, Oracle, Sun, IBM, Microsoft, I'm looking at you. The list goes on. Yeah, there is a, there's a kind of a it's kind of a, a very simple rule. Anybody who thinks they understand date time handling really well doesn't. Anybody who thinks they do not understand date time handling really well is probably right. Okay? It's really simple. But I pick on that as an interesting domain. Because how would you represent a date? I could represent it year, month, and day. 
I could also represent as number of days since an epoch date. Both of these are valid. Which one's the best? The word the best, best is an interesting word. You know what? I can do, I can implement both of those. That's fine. Tell you what, why don't we not depend on that? Why don't we not depend on the fact that it's one integer or three integers? Why don't we capture a concept called date and make the concept stable and we separate that out? This is old school classic encapsulation. But it's not just at the, the little stuff. It turns out that that's quite big. You, if you've ever seen a large code base where you've had a representation assumption that's gone all the way through and you've decided to change it, you will have realized that lots of little things repeated become a big thing. It turns out it becomes architectural. But we see this all the time. One of the classic examples that you see is in web browsers or in web apps. Look at the, look at the actual address on a lot of pages and you will still see in the URL dot PHP, dot ASP. I looked at one of those just last week. And it's a case of, well, hang on, why are you publishing your implementation technology as part of the address? You don't have to do that. You know, that's, that's kind of a little bit strange. You know, why are you losing the encapsulation of your system? Your system, from the user's point of view, should just be a system that does whatever it is, allows you to get tickets for Devternity except that it's sold out, you can't do that anymore. Allows you to buy books, yeah? That's what you want. But we publish the underlying technology, which leads to some really strange consequences. I spoke to a Ruby on Rails developer who had just redeveloped a site that was originally written in PHP and said, yep, we had to preserve all the PHP URLs as well. So now you have something that has got this legacy naming. It turns out it's very easy to inject. So this is this idea. This, in, this idea is deep. It's all the way through your architecture at every single level. It's a simple idea, it's not hard. I'm not saying it's not hard so you should, you know, why aren't you doing it? I'm saying it doesn't involve a lot of extra effort. It just involves slowing down. Now that's kind of an interesting one because slowing down is to, is, relates to how we do things in time. And there is, if you like, old school lean was very much more focused on this idea of eliminating waste. And that's part of the story, but these days tend to, tend to emphasize the idea of flow a lot more. That things are in flow, that they don't stop, start, stop, start, and stop forever. You know, that, that things are not blocked. There's a very different way of looking at it. And kind of what we're looking at is uh, picking up on a remark that I um, threw out earlier, the difference between project versus product. If in software development, we, have often, we often work in the project mindset. We often work with deadlines. And we know the consequences of those deadlines. As you work towards a deadline, what happens is that perhaps you achieve what you set out to do. You've now got something that works or kind of works but you're exhausted. It was hard to get there. And now you need to do it again. Well, that's not very clever. But also, what are you gonna do about all the shortcuts, all the technical debt? This was Ward, Ward's model. The whole point about a technical debt model is you are able to run up a slight debt to achieve a short-term objective and then you repay. This is the whole point of life cycles and code philosophies that allow you to say, and now we pay back for the next thing. I find a lot of people say, well, I've, again, going back to this idea, customers don't want to pay for this. Never assume what the customer wants unless they told you directly. Very few people ever ask the customer, hey, do you want us to really hit this deadline hard so that it messes up the next delivery? I think they'd probably say, no, why were you planning to do that? That sounds like a terrible idea. If we regard software development as a game, um, an idea I first came across um, through Alistair Coburn, uh, the idea of software development as a cooperative game, there is a very interesting thing about the nature of games. There are lots of different kinds of games. There's cooperative games, competitive games. There are games that are bounded and there are games that are unbounded. Okay, so standard, standard football match is structured as two halves of 45 minutes each way 
with a little bit of extra time um, on each half for injury and the possibility in a tournament of having extra time and maybe a golden goal um, uh, or a penalty shootout at the end. In other words, there's a clear structuring, but it has an end and it has a number of criteria for defining an end. It is about the end. That is how projects are structured. But that is entirely the wrong philosophy. Code that is written in that style is not written with this approach in mind. The idea of sustainable development is simply, you need to meet the needs of the present. Don't put off stuff for the perfect architecture that will come. It will always be six months in the future. You know, when are you going to deliver this system? Oh, in six months. You said that six months ago. Yep, my answer is consistent. Yeah? I visited a company that had exactly this. They've been working on the framework. And I think the framework was spelled in caps and in bold. And it was a few years late. But the problem is, we don't want to sacrifice the future in order to meet the present. It's a balancing act. That's why it's hard. If it were easy, we'd all be doing it. This is sustainability. It's this balancing act. But that's the point. Product development, and therefore, I would say, most code falls into this. Not all code. Sometimes code does have a very short lifetime. We know, we know certain things have a short lifetime. Things that are truly prototypes, not prototypes that go into production, things that are truly prototypes, things that are written in competitions. Competition code has a very bounded lifetime. There are a number of cases where we can say the lifetime of this code is fixed or it's short, and we know it's end. Sometimes there is a feature that we know is going to disappear because of a change, say, in government regulations. That, that, that's going to change in six months' time, and we will never need that piece of code again, so we shouldn't put all our refactoring effort on it. It works well enough. Sure, it's not great, but in six months' time, because the law is changing, that code is no longer applicable. Sometimes code does have this property. But most of the time, when we're dealing with product development, the goal of the game is to keep playing the game. That's very different to the goal of football. We also have a number of really bad sayings that have made their way into software. You can guess which company popularized this just from my use of the font. But this is not unique to Facebook. This is actually an old engineering saying. It dates back to the 1950s, as best as I can get. Could be wrong, could go back further. Move fast and break things, well, like democracy and stuff like that. That's not what we want at all. I don't think it is. I don't think that's the right philosophy. I think we actually need to do exactly the opposite, move slow. I think people are obsessed with speed. I've, I don't, I've, I've never seen anybody develop something fast that's come out well. We want to have some kind of sense of progress, but we're trying to play the game to keep on playing the game. It turns out that the obsession with speed, when people talk about deliver fast, in fact, that was one of the original principles of lean development, and I still see it now. In fact, I did a keynote at a company event where they sort of said, I think, what was the tagline? It was uh, faster, better, etc. some tagline like that. The first thing I did was get up on stage and say, you don't want to do things faster. There's a subtle difference. You want to do things sooner. Not faster, sooner. Now, let me clarify the difference, because this is a linguistic difference, but it has a huge, huge um, uh, consequence. So, when my kids were younger, um, my wife and I used to have to act as, act as a taxi service. My older son has just passed his driving test, so he is now the taxi service. Um, so, you see, this is what life cycles are all about. Um, so, we used to have to taxi them around. And sometimes at the weekend, we'd end up, you know, oh, this child has to go to this party, and then we're gonna, we, I've, I've got to do this, so I'll take the other child, and then we'll meet up somewhere, and maybe it'll be at the cinema, or maybe it'll be somewhere for a, 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 sort of some fast food. But whatever happened, we'd end up with two cars. And so then we'd say, okay, let's go home. And a child would choose a parent, you know, one child, one parent. Who's going to get home first? Uh, 
I would always drive faster, but my wife would always arrive sooner. I have, I have the speeding tickets to prove it, okay? But I also have a relatively poor sense of direction. I don't have good knowledge of routes. This relates to knowledge. Your goal here is to accumulate the knowledge that allows you to do things sooner. It may be faster in execution. From the outside, it looks faster, but there is a subtle difference. My wife had far better route knowledge. She would travel a shorter distance more effectively with less fuel and less time. That's what you're trying to aim for. Simply looking busy is not, is not really the goal of software development. So the point here is you want to focus on velocity, not speed. Now, I know there are lots of teams who say, yes, we're focused on velocity. No, you're not. You're focused on speed. There is a subtle difference. And this is where, you know, somewhere in my past, I have a degree in physics. This is where my, my kind of like care about words comes out again. Because speed is a magnitude. Velocity includes direction. Most teams that say they're focusing on velocity have no idea what their velocity is. It's kind of like saying, yes, I'm heading at 150 kilometers per hour. Are you heading in the right direction? I have no idea, but I'm going really fast. You're going north 150 kilometers per hour. Yes, you do know you should be going south. It turns out that walking would have been faster. So there is this idea that teams are obsessed with this one-dimensional view of how to measure themselves. It's not their fault, but it, there is a, we have an echo chamber culture where we've reinforced this message. Progress is not simple and linear. What you need to do is, are we moving in the right direction in the right way? Is it fuel efficient, is the simple way of putting it. How much effort are we putting into our code? How, uh, you know, is the code responding well every time we need to do changes? Is it the hardest thing in the universe, or actually, is it OK? And is it actually what the customer needs? Yeah, th this kind of thing. This is, a, this, is a, this is a more subtle process. And we understand that such processes are cyclic. And there's a classic way of looking at this, plan, do, study, act. The PDSA cycle, deming Schuart cycle. I first encountered this in the 1990s, I think probably under the TQM um, uh, thing, total quality management thing, and I didn't pay, it, pay much attention to it. And it was only when I started reading more deeply in the 2000s on development process, I suddenly realized this is really simple. This is the only development process you kind of ever need to start from because it has everything that you need. You can make it more sophisticated, you can make it simpler. Here's what we're going to do. Let's try doing it. Let's slow down. This is, by the way, you may have heard a variant of this, Plan, Do, Check, Act, PDCA. I prefer study, the original formulation, for a very simple reason. Study sounds slower. Okay, my, my older boy is about to take exams next year to go to university. My wife and I are not simply encouraging him to check his work. Have you checked your work? Yep, done. Checking is really quick. Study sounds slow, and so it should. It takes time. It takes, you have to make a deliberate effort to do it. How are we doing? Is that, was that the right thing? Did we do that well? Could we have done it better? You know, what, what, what questions has that raised? That's the other important one. We don't stop to ask questions about what we're doing. Should we ask the client this? Maybe that's a good idea. Should I ask the architect this? Should we ask each other this? Is there a tool that would make that easier? And then whatever you've discussed and decided, do something about it, make it so, repeat. We can even see that that is reflected when you talk about test-driven development. It's not just a, a macro scale thing over weeks and months. A TDD cycle, people often rephrase it in terms of red-green refactor, which is kind of okay, but I've never been found it very compelling. And when people sort of say, the first thing you do is write something that doesn't pass a test. Well, that's not exactly a very, cha very big challenge. <laughs> write something that doesn't work, done. <laughs> Come on, give me, something, give me something else. No, the way you look at it, look at these four steps. What does success look like? That's your plan. What is the simplest thing that could possibly work? That's your do. Take a step back. What's going on? What are the gaps and repetitions, inconsistencies or trends I have about the code or the tests or the domain? That's your study. How would you address them? That's your act. 
It turns out these cyclic structures are really simple. You don't need to learn lots of different methodologies. It turns out once you've got this in your head and you realize it works at different scales, it's very powerful. Which takes us to this other thing, which I've kind of suggested is quite important. It turns out that people really are quite important when it comes to software development. And there's, you know, I've just mentioned TDD, so I'm going to pick on James Grenning's um, definition of TDD uh, from his book, Test Driven Development for Embedded C. Now, I do this for a number of reasons. One, I like the way that he has described TDD here. TDD is fun. It's like a game, oh, it's the game metaphor again, where you navigate a maze of technical decisions that lead to highly robust software while avoiding the quagmire of long debug sessions. With each test, there is a renewed sense of accomplishment. Well, that's quite good. You know, you feel like you're going forward. And clear progress toward the goal. Automated tests record assumptions, capture decisions, and free the mind to focus on the next challenge. Here, he's talking about a lot of things, and yet has captured quite well a lot of our motivation for unit tests, whether we do them TDD or not, or any kind of test. But what is interesting here, it's not just that, it's also the fact that it's for embedded C, because sometimes people tell me, oh, yeah, I see that TDD stuff you're talking about. Well, that's all right for C Sharp, Java, whatever. But we're in a special domain. We're special. Yeah, are you special as embedded C? That's the thing I think is interesting. When people say, oh, we can't do that because we're special. OK, here's something that's fairly special. There's a whole book on it. But there's something else here. Look at that. We, are a la we keep focusing on productivity. That's another one of those speed words. I think that we should probably focus a little more on enjoyment. It turns out that most problems to do with organizational culture, team effectiveness, and all the rest of it disappear when people just start enjoying themselves. If you're doing things that are pleasurable, you know what? Most of the problems disappear. You don't have to do anything. You don't need to read a book on a new technique to apply to your team. Turns out that these have human consequences. Now, I can't give you beauty, but I can give you something that is similarly aesthetic. Um, in Patterns of Software, in, in the 1990s, Dick Gabriel talked about a very simple idea. Habitability is the characteristic of source code that makes a place livable like home. When we talk about architecture and software architecture, we are normally focused on structure. But for some reason, for such a long time, we have missed the implication of the metaphor. Building architecture is for people. It's not just there to look pretty. It's not just there to be what has been termed magazine architecture. You know, some buildings look really good in magazines with nice photographs, but they don't work quite so well with people in them. The purpose of a building is to have people in it. What's it like? The purpose of a software architecture is not simply to be a structure that is rational. It's to allow people to work within it. So we have a kind of a simple observation that it's a place that we live. It's how we organize our teams. Biggest advantage of autonomously working teams is risk reduction through group intelligence. This goes back to the knowledge idea. As a team, you're not simply a bunch of people who are good or hope to be good. What you're trying to do is think better, think more broadly. And this is one of those simple observations. You can't just add a bunch of people together and hope that it works out. I've, this is a problem with how we often recruit people. We often end up recruiting people like ourselves. We recruit people for being a good fit, whatever that is. We recruit people just based on their technical skills. And it's important that they do have some appropriate technical skills, but actually, there's other skills that are more important. There's a little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. But if a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. Now, there are a few of you here already knew that, but I'm going to say collectively, we could be smarter in this room. And it turns out there's a very simple reason for some of this. People from diverse backgrounds might actually alter the behavior of a group's social majority in ways that lead to improved, more accurate group thinking. It comes down to how people examine facts, how people communicate. It turns out that if you're trying to do software development, which is one of the most intellectually challenging things that humans have ever done, Thinking, having lots of people thinking the same way is actually not very helpful. It means you're not really thinking. Having lots of people who have the same degree, who have the same, come from the same place, have the same background, turns out that's a bit of a problem. 
Yeah, it kind of gets you over one hump, but slams you straight into the next wall. It turns out you do need to have people looking at things very, very differently. And that will allow you to get, instead of groupthink, collective intelligence. The wisdom of crowds, as it's referred to. James Sirowicki said, you know, four conditions that characterize wise crowds. Diversity of opinion, independence, decentralization, and aggregation. You can't all think the same way, but you do have to get together. Now, one of the best observations when it comes to human beings, because uh, I love, this is a very simple one, uh, Hillel Wayne, um, one of my most controversial software opinions is that your sleep quality and stress level matter far, far more than the language you use or the practices you follow. A huge difference. Oh, we spend so long arguing about this stuff. And it's fun sometimes, but as he says, nothing else comes close. Not type systems, not TDD, not formal methods, not anything. And he's a formal methods advocate. His, his stuff's really good, but he's right. It really makes a huge difference. It's your ability to take on the world is measurably changed when you've had a decent night's sleep. And that actually, you know, when you don't feel stressed, that actually has a huge consequence. So overall, there's this interesting effect that, and I'm going to end by putting it all together, holism. You've got to take everything into account. When it comes to your code, this is a lovely book, Christmas is Coming. This is a good book. And it's, it's a good book because it's a good book for a number of reasons. One, I found it quite inspiring. It's about building architecture, yet about half the design applies to any design based, or half the advice applies to any design based discipline. The other thing is, this is one of those books that if people see that you have it, they will immediately think that you are far smarter, more sophisticated than you are. Okay, oh, not just a software developer, yeah? Always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. We often focus, we're very good at focusing in. Sometimes you need to just zoom out. You know, when people talk about algorithms in computer science, they don't focus on where they're being used. They focus very much on the inward aspect, which is fine, but you have to then zoom out. And we, have, uh, we have some very interesting language going on. I did a search the other week, and. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, full stack developer. Okay, that's a great phrase. Even better, you've got to be passionate as well. It's just like, wow, this is really hard work. I've got to be full stack and passionate. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of love for a lot of code. Okay. Maybe we're overrating that. We need to be careful with our words. My experience is that front end development, back end development, that's what people normally mean when they talk about full stack development. Now, I'm not really a web developer at all. My background is actually the other bit of the stack, the, the bit of the stack that kind of goes down. And this is my background. So when people say I'm a full stack developer, it's kind of like, oh, so what's your work on device drivers like? What? Well, that's the stack. That stack goes all the way down there. You know, I'm not saying everybody needs to know this, but there's another direction as well, which I think is kind of important. It turns out the full stack is quite deep. It turns out, where is this being used? Am I thinking about it as a product or as a short-term goal? Am I just thinking about the next deadline? What about the people who are going to use it? We are very, we're, we're very poor at thinking about users and the true user experience. In fact, we've even degraded the idea of user experience to simply mean UI design. And a lot of people who say, I'm doing user experience, they're not. They're just pushing buttons around. I think that the idea is much deeper. We should actually care about the user experience. What is their experience actually like? Not do, what do I think it's like? And then there's the broader picture, some of which I touched on in my keynote two years ago. Development needs to go further than the technical stack. It includes the world and the people around the software. So on that note, hopefully, I've given you a kind of sense of what I mean by lean code, and hopefully these are thoughts that you can take forward to your work and to your coffee. Thank you.